So uh, I'm here with my long-term uh, hetero life mate friend, Jake Stroop. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> From Jay and Silent Bob, I'm sure you can appreciate. Um, yeah. And <laughs> he's... <laughs> he's here on Facebook Messenger uh, talking to me live. And it, it's been a while since we caught up and I just wanted to record... Um, our session and our catch up and kind of just yeah, turn it into a it's podcast. Been years since we've seen each other in person. I mean, yeah, let's start there. When's the last time you remember seeing me in person? Jeez, talking to you in person. Uh, I think I remember. Be, uh, 2000 and, uh, I'm going to guess and say 2016, maybe 2017. Uh, there was one day um, I was home for a year. Uh, home being the Philadelphia, the greater Philadelphia area. Uh, I was staying in Haddonfield with Longmore at the time. Yep. Uh, I had some old court uh, cases <laughs> that uh, I had to clear up. Um, and I had just gotten out of jail in Florida um, for possession. Uh, okay. And I decided that, you know, if I was going to do, I had done close to six months, whatever, sitting around. Uh, I figured, you know, if I was going to do that down in Florida, I might as well, you know, sack up and go up north and take care of the rest of the, uh, the legal uh, things that were slowing me down otherwise, you know? So. Right, yeah, I, I remember that. I think it was around 2017, maybe 2018, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, relatively speaking. I, I dipped back to, I dip back to uh, South Florida that time uh, on May 8th uh, because it was exactly one year from when I initially came back up to the Philadelphia area and... Uh, did you hear that at all? Yeah, I we I got it. <laughs> Did that record that played fully on the recording? <laughs> well, I don't know what you're referencing. If, if it oh, will. okay, no, a song just came on my side. I was listening to Spotify, which is you know what you do. Right. <laughs> and uh, but anyway, so yeah, I had um, it was May eighth, which was exactly one year to the day that uh, I came from Florida up to Philadelphia. So I, uh, um, so I remember the dates as far as what day I came back to Philly and what day I left Philly again. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And right. uh, I remember our time was spent. Uh, I, I briefly picked you up and would drop you off or take you to sets <laughs> for you to get your your fix. Oh, is that what uh, is that what we did? Yeah, I mean, I think I actually was also actively trying to get something like ketamine or whatever. And you're like, oh, yeah, I can get anything over here. Just take me oh, here. Hold on a second. <laughs> yeah. Every, um, I'm getting, at this point, I'm getting like every other word of yours. Oh. And, and I don't think it's reception on my side. Hold on. What about now? Can you hear me better? Yeah, that was better. Um, okay. So, wait, I think... uh, go back into it. You were asking me to... To get you something, or? Yeah, well, basically, uh, I think it was right around the time that me and Paul were doing the whole uh, Calvin Klein combination of drugs, and you claimed that you could help get me that stuff, but ultimately we just ended up taking you to a set where you, you know, assumedly brought, okay, bought... You're breaking up. I heard that you and Paul were trying to do some kind of substitution kind of thing. <laughs> no, I said uh, Calvin Klein, the uh, drug uh, combination. Uh, okay. Um, but ultimately, yeah, our, our our interaction at that time was pretty brief and pretty much just used each other to facilitate our oh, drug yeah, habits. Oh, yeah, that's right. We went, didn't we go to, like, Plato's Closet or something? Mm, no, we went to a set in Camden. Uh, okay. <laughs> Okay. Well, that's always a good time. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. But but you know, yeah. Let's let's just. I'm just saying that the the original question was when was the last time we physically saw each other, and yeah, the answer be, uh, is we, we, about six years ago. <laughs> six years, yeah. Six, seven years ago. Six yeah. years ago, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know what? I don't think we should shy away from that kind of stuff in conversation. No. You know, I think that you know, if if we're trying to 
you know, be fully open on a podcast that, you know, uh, full disclosure from the masses would be a good thing. I think that... Sure, sure. The general public would eat up my fucking... My, uh... My, well, my disease of excess, as I like to refer to it. Well, I mean, let's just, uh, now that we talked about the last time we saw each other, do you want to kind of briefly describe our history of how we know each other and where, you know, our connection stems from? Yeah, well, so uh, I guess we both got into a little bit of trouble when we were youngsters, <laughs> would be the right way to phrase it. Um, I caught... Uh, I caught a case, um, again, based around um, st- substances. You and, primarily um, alcohol at the younger stage, if I'm not oh, mistaken. Yeah. yeah, I was. I was primarily, uh, my, my problem, my, my, my problem was drinking. Um, but what I got in trouble for was indeed, um, was indeed substances. Uh, okay. Substances. Um, and I, uh, went to, um, you know, J- JDC, which is Juvenile Dip- Disciplinary Center. Uh, you, they are, they are, they are all over the country. That is the generic term for, uh, Juvenile Hall or, uh, Juvie. Uh, Juvie, yeah, I think that's the, the common, uh, nomenclature that most, uh, pedestrians would use. Right, right, but... <laughs> So I refer to it as JDC uh, because that's how it referred to me at the time. And uh, yeah, so I had to deal with that for a few months and then uh, I was allowed out and uh, um, Tom Longmore essentially took over, um, you know, my my, uh, guardianship, but you and I, got to well initially what was it you told you just talked about it the first time that we met was uh i was um high school yeah you you were (laughs) selling mushrooms in high school and i approached you i believe you were wearing or uh you had dreadlocks (laughs) white people you had white people dreadlocks and (laughs) (laughs) yes yes uh and you had this kind of grunge punk aesthetic going on and I came up to you because Alex and Jesse or whoever were like, Oh, go talk to him about getting mushrooms. And I went up to you and I'm like, Hey, I'm trying to, I'm Josh or whatever. And you just like, I remember you just very warmly like greeted me, maybe gave me a hug and then just were like, go on your way, little one. (laughs) Like, (laughs) That was the, uh, yeah, first things first, my uh, ego was absolutely out of control back then. Well, uh, can, thought, let me just, of myself. well, let me just uh, give some validity to that, is that technically at that time, you were in pristine physical condition and were very capable yeah. of running and doing physical feats that impressed the ladies and your peers alike. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, no, I was a, I was a very capable individual. I just don't think that that uh, justifies kind of some some of my arrogance at the time. Uh, I, I know that. Uh, yeah, I ha- I had it. They say if you got you know if you got it, flown it. Um, but that's not. <laughs> well, they uh, they say uh, beauty is a short-lived tyranny. <laughs> Them, them, they be saying. Yeah, people so, say lots uh, of shit. <laughs> so, uh, and and the other thing is, if if we were in school, I know at the time, I most certainly was still looking out for five uh, O. I was uh, always thinking about not getting caught. Sure, uh, and you, you definitely yeah. didn't know me at the time, or maybe you saw me, but it probably was yeah. like, oh yeah, I can't, I don't know you, know you enough to to sell you or trust you with. Uh, you know, taking this any further at that time. Not in school, not like that. I would have probably, uh, you know, if you had let me know exactly uh, your intention and the amount, or maybe giving me your information, I may have been <laughs> able to hit you up later. Well, again, it was fine. It wasn't even for me. I had no interest at the time. I was just kind of uh, a, a proxy, uh, if you will. Oh, uh, okay. Well, then, yeah. Well, then it went down probably just as it should. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, let's fast uh, forward a little bit, uh, maybe, maybe, what, a year or so later? Uh, I think it was a 
less than a year, we yeah. were uh, both under the guise of one of the biggest morons I've ever met in my life. <laughs> yeah, he, he, a, he uh, tried to do good. <laughs> <laughs> a gentleman named Dexter. Um, he's about well, six, unless, foot, well, six foot three. Three, six, yeah, four, and he w- he was an African American or Mexican yeah. uh, type of individual. Yeah, he, uh, there. He, was, he was. He was a black guy. Uh, he was uh, working for a company that uh, essentially he was a case manager for um, what would we call ourselves? Oh wait, no, we uh, we had uh, we both had Dyfus. He was our Dyfus worker, the Division of oh, Youth and Family Services, he, oh, and yeah. he uh, was assigned to take us to the Boys and Girls Club uh, for our mandatory. Community time, time integration, together, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, I remember. Mm-hmm. Well, can you can you recall the uh, his car and the conditions of driving? Uh... I can. Uh, so it was a coupe. <laughs> oh, you it remember? Was a, it was a two door. That's the other thing. He was like six foot three, six foot four, probably a good two hundred fifteen, two hundred twenty pounds. Okay. And he uh, was driving a two door. Uh, what was it like? What could I even explain? Um, not a fiesta. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, it that doesn't. Let's not get caught up on the those type of details. It, it, yeah, well, it was a tiny little car that he squoze. Oh, there's me going making up a word again. <laughs> squoze. I I say squoze is the past tense of squeeze. Okay. Because I sure. I think of squee or uh, sorry freeze and froze. Frozen. Sure. 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 <laughs> And I, I did this, this is funny, I did this for years, and I served tables and fine dining uh, for, you know, <laughs> yeah. for, for years. I yeah. worked at, you know, Capitol Grill and Cheesecake Factory sure. and Yard House. And take this. Higher uh, end, uh, corporately owned uh, uh, um, fine dining restaurant. And I would, it's so embarrassing, uh, <laughs> because I didn't know, I honestly, and, 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 and tables would laugh. Uh, I guess at me. <laughs> right, not with I you. Yeah. Up on it because I would say every Sunday morning, I'd be like, yeah, we have apple juice, cranberry juice, we got water, we have freshly squozen orange juice. <laughs> squozen. And I, would just, and I would just keep it moving like that was a but real you, word. But you know what's funny is they, they clearly, like, language is all about uh, <laughs> taking what you want in your mind and then making the other person understand it. So regardless yeah. of appropriate grammar or technicalities of what words exist or don't, you conveyed your point. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate that. And yeah, no, 100%, they got what I meant. And, and, it, and, it, and it is very funny, but like how I found out of it at the time was definitely a blow to my intellectual ego. My I could see that. My girlfriend, Ellen, I don't know if you remember Ellen. Was that high school uh, era? No, that was Samantha, that was Sam Steph here. Uh, Ellen was uh, two or three serious yeah, relationships. You know, in my in my mind, the high she school, the high school she, one is a Blumpkin princess. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. I'll tell that story too okay. one day, yeah. maybe on this one. But, there you go. Uh, <laughs> we, um, uh, just as a disclosure, full disclosure, she did not do it. Uh, just. Just letting uh, people know that. Uh-oh. So the story is funny, regardless of the fact that I don't want people like her name because I did just say her name. <laughs> you did just say uh, her name out there. If this is if this is like put out and uh, uh, publicized, sure, so to sure. speak, uh, <laughs> people getting the wrong idea and being like, "This girl gave No, she didn't. Get it the was wrong high thing. school. It was a wild time. People were trying <laughs> things. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, it was, yeah, it was. <laughs> And uh, but no, Ellen was uh, Ellen was a girl that I met our last day when uh, Mark Otterson and I uh, had the apartment in Fox Meadows. Oh yeah, I remember that place. I remember yeah, his then, his car didn't have a real seat. <laughs> Do you remember that? And he had like a bu- a five gallon bucket or something instead. Oh, no, he sold he sold that to me. I drove that Chevy Lumina for. Right, I, for I know. I was just months. commenting yeah. on the 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 seating. Uh, <laughs> Or lack thereof. <laughs> lack thereof, yeah, for sure. There was an interior car fire uh, set by Mark himself uh, by accident. He uh, he lit a cigarette with a, uh, a the, the last match of a box of matches. Yeah. And uh, just tossed the uh, the match, uh, the little match book, little match pack, back into the car, thinking it had extinguished, and went into the mall. Without yeah. turning around, you know. Right. 
and when he came out, there was, it was just billowing, uh, you know, black Yeah, smoke. well, he, he, he hasn't been one for uh, doing his due diligence. Let's just, let's just leave it at that. <laughs> Especially considering his, uh, the child that he's been raising that wasn't his. Wait, what? Jude, Jude's not his? Never was. And he just, well, he, he's, he's in denial, but my, my, my full evidence on this is he's never done a paternity test. And Mrs. Miss Tice, who draws infants and babies and was commissioned by Mark to have a, a portrait of their baby drawn, concluded that that was not his child. And, and, and there was a lot of evidence to that point. And despite bringing that to his attention, he was like, I'm happy being ignorant. And it's like, again... There's your car on fire and your due diligence, bro. <laughs> I love Mark. I love Mark. Nah. He's a great guy. And if he's raising a kid that's not his, he's a father. You know, God bless him. More power to him. Okay. He's a great guy. You know, uh, yeah, you're right. He might be a little clumsy and he might do his, uh, he might have his own way about things. Let's just say that. Okay. But, uh, yeah, no, uh, yeah, we'll get back to that. Okay. But anyway, uh, I met Ellen, um, the last day that we had that uh, apartment in Fox Meadow, right. uh, he was throwing a party. He was throwing a party, uh, and I got off work at Capitol Grill um, and got home probably eleven thirty, maybe close to twelve, and like it was in full swing. A party was it was surging at our apartment. There was probably about 30, 40 maybe people in there, and if you recall, it was a one oh, bedroom. Oh, I remember. A spare yeah. with a big uh, winding couch sectional or like a L couch yeah, or whatever. We had a good setup there. Yeah. I, I, I liked it. I liked how we were doing things. Yeah, it was a nice little bachelor pad for some young guys at the time. Yeah, we were 22. Uh, yeah. And uh, was it? maybe it was 23 at the time. Uh, doesn't matter. But anyway, Ellen had brought her friend Tiffany over who, who had, had a crush on Mark and she comes up to me. <laughs> I mean, I just got home. I'm, I don't even know if I had hopped in a shower yet. <laughs> yeah, probably. I'm still wearing, you know, my, my full yep. suit. Right. Uh, so I was looking awfully dapper, I'm sure. Yep. <laughs> Not, there, there goes that arrogance. But anyway, she comes up to me and says, my friend Tiffany uh, had me bring her over uh, because uh, she wants to hook up with Mark. And I was like, oh. Well, she's not, like, talking to him. Like, <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I wanted to come over. She's a little shy. I wanted to come over here and, like, help her out. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, who are you? <laughs> and, she, right. and uh, you know, from from there, it was, uh, I warned her. I said, you know, I might not be the guy that you want to, you know, be spending your your time thinking about or otherwise spending with. And she, uh, she, she just, you know, ignored me. So, uh, fast forward however many years till I'm working at Cheesecake Factory. And, uh, I tell her my open, she says, how do you greet tables? I tell her on Sunday mornings, I, I talk about the cranberry juice and the, and the, uh, apple juice, sparkling apple juice. And well, the so, uh, and orange juice. Jake, and she said, I think we're getting a little off topic here. We, we. We were not discussing oh, yeah. the, the your sexual accomplishment. <laughs> no, 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 I wasn't. I was talking okay. about the etymology of squozen. Oh, well, I think we, we I think we covered that, so let's just... All right, all right. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, that, okay. was, that was big fast forward. You and I fucking, we go to the Boys and Girls Club, and... And we're 14, 15-ish, <laughs> give or take, right? Yeah, time. yeah, okay. yeah. I think I think I was 16 at the time. Yeah, you are a little um, older than me, I believe. So that would. Yeah, I just turned I just turned 36 last Friday. So. I'm 35, uh, so yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So. Uh, yeah, you say yeah, last yeah. Friday? Just, uh, happy Happy belated. Uh, not the 13th, the 6th. Oh well, still Happy Blade. I, I I think you were MIA at the time. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> I didn't even know it was my birthday. I was no. uh, dog sick and. Uh, uh, couldn't even, uh, couldn't put, uh, thoughts together, let alone well, celebrate my let's, birthday. Let's just kind of fast forward. We're in the car, and then do you remember laughing harder than you've ever laughed before with me, uh, in the back seat over, like, making fun of Dexter or telling each other oh. jokes and stuff? <laughs> Man, I mean, you and I have had some, I've, I've laughed harder, uh, at a lot of the things that you and I have done over time. 
than uh, than most than most people than because you and I like we get each other on a level that it's uh it's fairly unique. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm, have, uh, I'm glad you say that because there, there's one moment in particular that I find, you know, uh, to toot my own horn, I thought was particularly funny. It was when we were sitting in front of Cherry Hill West, like in like the parking lot of the hospital that like was facing West. And right. Jason, Jason went to walk into the high school to like get a paper or like, I forget what he wanted to do, but we were just waiting for him to come back. And as he, like, walks off into the horizon, I turn to you and I'm like, and that's the last we ever saw of good old Jason. <laughs> yeah. It's, I don't even know why that's funny, but I just say I, I, it sticks oh, out in my mind. <laughs> so it makes me think about Stand By Me, the movie, and I know that's what it made me think about when you said it all those years ago. Like, what you might find even more fascinating is I don't think I've ever seen that movie and I've just heard that line as like a pop culture statement that I just thought was funny there. Yeah, they do. <laughs> I think even Family Guy did a thing on it. Where, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So in that movie, in, in Stand By Me, Richard Dreyfus, who's the guy that was uh, that was on Jaw, was in Jaws. He's okay. the guy that came sure. through with the boat. Right. He was the guy that narrated Stand By Me, and they had him do a thing on Family Guy where it was actually <laughs> Richard Dreyfus. Okay, nice. So you probably... Yeah, that's uh, probably what I saw as a fucking Family Guy skit, and I just incorporated <laughs> it into my life without even knowing the context. Yeah, it was perfect. <laughs> it was good. It was, so you know how it is about comedy. It's not, Everything is timing, it timing, is. timing, is. and... Uh, that was just perfectly timed. And that was the last we ever saw. <laughs> yeah. I like, um, think, I like to think nowadays he's a nuclear engineer. <laughs> But he probably works at the local subway. <laughs> that's that's amazing. Um, uh, but, I mean, do you remember our time at the Boys and Girls Club? We actually would go yeah. there, and they had all the African-American kids played basketball, and we were just like, yeah. uh, we're, we're excluded from that. Like, And yeah. we so, played cards or fucked around upstairs. Yeah, so to set that stage, you know, it was... Um, that Boys and Girls Club that we went to was in Camden, New Jersey. Right, one of the and worst if, cities in America. People, yeah, if people don't know what that is, it is a smaller town. Uh, I believe at one point it was the capital of uh, New Jersey. It was put together by the mayor back in, I don't know, 40s, 50s, uh, to sort of be a, 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 a nice... Uh, oh, yeah, it was beautiful when it, they first built it, I believe. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Walt Whitman's house. Oh in, yeah, uh, in downtown Camden. His graves, uh, his graves there too. I think in in the cemetery down there. <laughs> he, st he still lives in the cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> so so legend states. <laughs> they say he still. You can still still hear him knocking on the inside of his coffin. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, but it turned out to be you know at that time I think around uh, 2002, 2002, it was murder capital per capita. It is a small town, small yeah. city. No. Uh, okay. That's a Google, yeah, you could Google that. When was Camden, New Jersey, uh, the murder capital? We it had overtaken Detroit by I don't know, point point two people or something per hundred. I don't know. But, uh, well, it was a very dangerous place where you would literally get murdered, raped, robbed uh, if you just went down the wrong... Sh and it's not even going down the wrong street. Like, if you're just in the city, you were at risk, basically. You were at risk, 100%. And we used to get, um, we used to get loitering tickets a little bit in the, in the future when I started doing, uh, you know, Drugs. heroin and other opiates, yep. uh, cocaine, things like that. Uh, we would, uh, if you were in the wrong part of town, which is all of it, uh, <laughs> well, and, they, and well, the police well, saw you, they would give you a, a ticket. Yeah, just for being you, there. You didn't even have to break any laws. Just being there in the city uh, was a crime. Yeah, loitering in a drug, known drug area mm -hmm. was the ticket. It was a good so, 500 e I want to say 560 bucks, something like yeah. that. I got well, a couple of let's, them. We're skipping ahead of, uh, quite a few years here. I, I wanted to take it yeah. from the Boys and Girls Club. I think I we exchanged numbers. We found out that we live just down the street from each other, down essentially. Street, yeah, yeah, like a, less than a mile or about, about a mile, maybe. About a mile, yeah. <clears throat> And yeah. uh, do you remember the first night you invited me over to your house? You had me 
chug a full party red party cup of Captain Morgan for my very first alcohol experience? Yeah, I did that. Yeah, well, you did that. It was probably a little less than full. full <laughs> mm, no, I remember it, it. It was like on the brink of like the top of the cup. It was around three quarters. There might have been some you ice. Had a good twelve ounces <laughs> of, uh, of Captain Morgan. Yeah, you had a little. A little less than a pint, our captain. Right, but for it was Which you gotta. A lot. Yeah, for my very time. first, and, and I take and I remember asking him like, "What do I like? What do I do? Do I like take it as a shot?" And you're just yeah, just chug the whole thing, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> and I did, yeah, if I you remember. A, I, had, I had a hell of a drinking habit at the time. And well, I uh, didn't. Um, but I'm just saying, do you remember what happened right after I drank that cup? Didn't we have to have dinner with my parents or something? Uh, no, your mom came up to, to, to your room, which was on the second oh. story, and you had yeah. me hide in the crevice between your bed and the window on the floor. As your mom came in and, like, lectured you, I'm just fucking shit-faced on the floor, like, where am I? What? And, and if you remember, do you remember how you got me to your house? Did I steal a car and pick you up? Yeah, you stole one of your parents' cars barefoot. And then picked oh, me, yeah. <laughs> picked me up. You're like, get in, <laughs> you know. Yeah, good times, good memories. I, I do remember that. I remember that. I remember being barefoot and everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was. Yeah. Uh, that was around the beginning. Uh, actually, I can't even say that's true. I've been taking the car for like a year and a half at that point. Yeah. Well, and you uh, just side note had told me late, later later years later that you had started drinking at a family function where one of your aunts, uncles, or grandparents encouraged you to drink and I think started the whole drinking process for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, my, uh, let's put her out there. I'm sure they know anyway. And my Aunt Barb. Uh, so my mom's the oldest of 12. We're all Irish Oh, Catholic. wow, I didn't know there was F12. Wow, okay. Yeah, my mom is the oldest of 12. Six boys and six girls, uh, so... Herself and five other females. Um, my aunt Kathy had a heart attack and passed away about 37. So there were, you know, five of them total left. Well, I'm anyway, saying, do you, do you remember really, this? Do you remember the dynamic around your first drink at that family setting? Oh, geez, yeah. Uh, we were um, at my grandmother's uh, kitchen table, and when when her when we had a get together. You gotta understand, with twelve kids and all their kids and their spouses and everyone's spouse and, and girlfriends, and it, it, it was a good fifty to sixty people in the house. Okay. You know, at any given time. Uh, and how old were you, if you remember, approximately? Um, how old was I? Is that what you asked? Yeah. <clears throat> oh, geez, the first, the first, the first drink, uh, twelve maybe. Yeah, I think that's about what you, what I remember you saying. Yeah, the first the first drink to get drunk. Yeah, I was about twelve, uh, and my aunt Barb would uh, she would just ask me like discreetly, "You want anything?" And she I, she thought it was funny, you know. Again, a big Irish Catholic family from you know the, the, they they were raised in the fifties, sixties, seventies, so sure. like they, they they had a different mentality about it. And, uh, sure, sure. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm just I'm just curious. What are your thoughts looking back now on what if she didn't? Or I, you know, let's not play the butterfly effect game. But I just mean, uh, what are your thoughts uh, on like that whole now looking back? Oh, it, would, it, it, it wouldn't have mattered. I, uh, okay. I was on a, 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 a war path with, uh, with uh, lucidity, or, uh, which means being sober uh, to, to our... Well, can, our, you, our maybe, um, can you maybe but, describe uh, where yeah, that on, is rooted I from? Like, I, I know you had some issues with your mom and your dad, but I just mean, like, yeah. do you, can you pinpoint necessarily any specific event or series of events or situations that kind of led to that mindset oh man no i i'm gonna be honest with you i think uh i think most of my most of my inspiration for for developing alcoholism and, and addiction as it were mm -hmm. uh were, were were internal i uh you know I, I have my mental issues as well um and a and a, and a diagnosis that i disagreed with for 15 years um um, fuck it. That that being bipolar type one, and we'll we'll get into a discussion about that at some point. Uh, okay. Because I, I I really do want to clear the air, uh, not just with you, but if you know people are going to listen to this, um, 
uh, I, I, there's a lot of stigma that surrounds bipolar, and it, 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 it is a mood disorder. Right. Uh, but that does not mean that, you know, I fly off the handle or, mm. you know, my mood, I have mood swings, like uh, I'll be happy one minute and completely piss the other. Right. Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I think I can uh, attest to, you know, I've, I've been labeled or diagnosed with bipolar uh, at various points in my life. And, and I, oh. at, so, at certain points, believed it. Uh, yeah. Personally, myself, looking back now, I find that a lot of my behavior and uh, anger stems from frustrations um, in my home life or inability to, you know, control. F- uh, to control or fix the things that... I, you know, yeah, that could, right, and, and, but I guess what I'm trying to say is, like, I feel like a lot of the situations where I was perceived as, uh, maybe overly emotional or angry are, are not in the context of my exact situation at that time, and that it, it was a situational, um, uh, issue, not, not a chemical imbalance necessarily as per, you know, the bipolar might, uh, Right. I agree, related. I agree with you in that yours was m- much more, your issues were circumstantial, and I don't think that, you know, of the diagnoses you have, that uh, bipolar is one of them I would diagnose you with, and uh, to, to let people know, my experience with the uh, field of psychiatry and psychology is extensive, to say the very least. Okay. Uh, well, I guess idea. I'm just, I'm curious, having known me so well, if you don't think it's bipolar, do you have any just broad uh, diagnosis that you would attribute and, and and you won't offend me I'm just I'm just honestly curious what if anything you think I, I suffer from or have well, we, or, uh, in the past you have Asperger's. right I, I'm I'm a, I, I'm autistic I'm a highly functional autistic person yeah. where it takes me a long time to get comfortable with people be able to look them in the eye have physical connection right. even as like male friends and yeah. um you know, I think that's evident uh, just in, especially new people and new situations. I, I'm, I'm, I have trouble managing my anxiety and uh, my, uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I just agree that I'm, I'm a high, highly and, and functional that autistic. A, that is a, uh, so there's levels to everything, and right. one of the things that um, my life is is going to concern, uh, you know, with the degree that I'm going. The degrees that I am striving for is to have the, uh, you know, the credibility um, to uh, put together. Uh, um, I'm gonna write. I'm gonna write on uh, the the way that the mental the mental illness diagnostics need to be further into individualized basis. Uh, now the the, the, the term the, Jake is a uh, holistic. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a holistic approach where you you take the entire person and their right. circumstance into into consideration instead of treating a specific uh, illness or right. well, issue. Well, here's the thing. I just want to say this: in America, doctors are paid when you return. They uh, they give you they give you a, a pill or a band aid or they 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 want to they don't treat the underlying condition. They treat the symptoms well, they don't, of the condition. Yeah, they don't they don't and, and they don't want to cure it. Remember, They're like it it's. They are paid to keep you coming back and in almost the same way that you have to subscribe to a streaming network, you almost have to subscribe to mental health uh, treatment. Correct. Correct. And and that's one of the things uh, that that I'm, you know, uh, underneath it all enraged about. Uh, I... I, uh, It makes me sick. It it really does make me sick that, that, that... you know, so many people have uh, issues that could truly be uh, treated, that could truly be um, managed, and 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 they and they honestly can't get the right uh, um, level of uh, that uh, care. Uh, or, or to yeah, to really so that that actually is a great um, segue for me to bring up another point I've been recently seeing is that. Some of these younger generations, um, like, you know, even just 10 years or or so apart from us, uh, like 25 or so, they seem to have abandoned all personal responsibility for their mental health uh, care and divert to, well, my doctor is this, or my doctor said that, as if the doctor's note or prescription 
absolves them of personal responsibility and critical thinking mm -hmm. in understanding mm -hmm. the root of their problem and the fact that a lot of these medications, 99% of the time, are meant to be a short-term fix, not a long-term yeah. solution. Yeah. Well, this is, a, this is a rabbit hole I know we could go down for quite a while. Uh, I'll just say that in a few other countries, uh, I've seen a few TED Talks on this, and it's actually... They're very relevant to me, again, because of what I want to do. Um, well, can you also briefly describe what, or after that, describe what you're in school for and where you're at? Okay. There? Yeah. Um, so these TED Talks are geared towards uh, countries that uh, instead of prescribing, uh, you know, a pill for whatever mental illness it is, they go about, you know, as a community um trying to understand what the individual is going through and seeing if there's some other form of uh, alleviation. Like if you broke your leg and, and, you're, and you're a farmer, they, they went ahead and got the guy a milk cow so that he could still provide a service and he was, you know, working in the same sort of similar um, capacity. But uh, it, it gave him a purpose and that sense of purpose um, took care of the, the, the depression. Now, I'm, I'm glad you, you brought up purpose because I recently heard an old uh, proverb that um, I think is more relevant than ever in its simplicity. It goes that a man, um, and that means gender neutral man. Uh, right, a person, uh, <laughs> a person yeah. yeah. A person can only be happy if they have three things, if they have these three things. Something to do something to love and something to hope for mm. okay. and i've i found that it's beauty in that simplicity that r rings true with me more than anything in that uh in the peak of my depression and disability uh around 2012 to 2015 i had nothing to do nothing to hope for and nothing to love and it was the darkest time of my life yeah that sounds like sounds pretty dark dude uh and uh, one of the things that's kept me going all these years, and again, I'm 36, uh, and I've been through God knows a lot, um, is hope. You know, I, I have always maintained a, a, a level of hope um, that what I have been through will serve a cause. Um, I don't know what that is. I don't oh, know. Almost like how. it's a, uh, a means to an end. Yeah, man. Like, yeah. Like, uh, this can't all be for nothing. Like, it really can't. And I won't let it be otherwise. And that would be the reason that I am in school for uh, criminal justice with a focus on human services. That's what my bachelor's degree will be in. Okay. And the focus on human services is the uh, is really the 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 fruit of that branch. Uh, because uh, with my criminal record, my uh, my background, uh, I'm not going to become a cop or uh, a judge you know, or any uh, yeah, office. I probably won't be yeah. a government employee in any in any capacity again. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, when I was 16, I worked uh, for the school board. Uh, I was a babysitter, like for after care after after school care for kids. Okay. Which I guess I think technically is a government worker. Um, okay. Uh, I remember after catching my first felony, they were like, "You can no longer do this, sir." And I was like, "All oh, right, far out." Um, <laughs> yeah, I remember when uh, the three of us got our first felony. Me, you, and Jason. Um, yeah. They, first, they, adult, first adult felony. First adult felony. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> Well, Chasha, I mean, I guess I, I didn't really ever touch on the party I threw and the uh, the juvie mm. situation I went through. Oh, and, yeah. You know, but... Uh, yeah, well, wait, which... Folks you, were with that well, and you, you, you know what else, though? I feel like... I know this is a little bit of my ego talking, but I feel like the movie Project X was based yeah. heavily on what I did. And I know that there was a, some guy in Australia who did something yeah, similar years yeah, later, yeah, yeah. but did I not inspire him? You, you <laughs> definitely, that was definitely one of the more fucking ballsy parties. Well, and then uh, what happened after with uh, with running through the woods and, the, yeah. and everything. Yeah. So, yeah. 
zero regret, zero regret. So funny. Well, and then and the, the whole dynamic of um, what's his name, Danny uh, Carson, staying behind in the bathroom and then being on the phone. Josh, come back. Everything is fine. Like with the police literally standing like behind yeah, him. Yeah, that's some fuck <laughs> shit that he did. He did some fuck shit over the years. Oh yeah, no, he he he's one of the worst people I've ever regretted knowing. Uh, specifically, like uh, fuck whatever he did with me. After right. afterwards, with my younger brother at the time when he was in high school, Danny yeah. constantly would put him in handcuffs and throw him on the ground and and abuse and fuck with him. And he did it under the guise that, oh yeah, I'm Josh's friend. When we literally hadn't even been friends for years at that point, and so he was just right. being a creep and a piece of shit to uh, and, a, and, a, and harassing and assaulting my my brother uh, under oh, fake pretense. I heard. I heard. Uh, uh, well, you know what? I'm not sure. I'm not gonna say anything beyond that. Yeah. He, okay. Uh, you know, if this is going out. You know, this is going to be listened to by who knows how many people yeah. eventually. Like, listen, oh, yeah, we don't have to this throw them. may not be our biggest, <laughs> you know, we're just having a conversation. But, like, down the line, if, if, if we put together something that, that draws a lot of attention, uh, you know, I don't want to uh, regret some, you know, I'm talking about others. That's it. I'll talk about yeah. myself. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, I, I, we, I just was briefly touching on him uh, yeah, in reference to the party and, and him you know, being uh, compromised by the police when we were teenagers. Yeah, man. And he did some messed up shit to some younger Yeah, people. we can just leave it at that, you know, for now. Yeah, there. Um, and, uh, yeah, so for him to have, like, fucking cooperated with the police to, to have you brought back to your own fucking... What a dick move, dude. Like It was. It was quite, uh, like, quite cowardly and... Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's just what leave it at that. Tell him that they were going to arrest him if he didn't get you back. Like, you, you know, I, I I want to sympathize with people like that who one have never dealt with the police before, don't know their rights or responsibilities. But true. he he was a minor, and these police and the police clearly coerced him into coerced him, in, in, into acting on their behalf without his representation or his parents' consent. So it's like... Yeah. Well, I know entrapment... Entrapment is illegal in a lot of states, but it's... Uh, you can actually... It's legal in Florida. I don't know about New Jersey, but you can... That's a form of entrapment. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it, what happened happened. I, I just was simply saying... Uh, well, right. uh, well, I guess let me uh, summarize it by saying the party that I did through um resulted in uh charges for criminal mischief and burglary uh which was subsequently dropped um yeah. and i actually still hold a lot of resentment towards that dynamic because my parents who were on a cruise and away and not at the house at the time uh were called and asked if they wanted to press charges on me so that they could quote keep me keep me or right. keep me safe or however they phrased it to which my right. parents or my father specifically agreed um and it's like okay that's one thing if you if you, you you file charges or there was like an alleged misconduct that you want to you know let the police interject okay. on but right. but but here my real issue is that after i was charged um, when I finally went to, to court over it, a juvenile court, my parents, who were the ones who pressed the charges on me, also uh, declined to get me proper representation and then basically threw me completely down the river saying, oh, like, I never had a, a, a defense or any uh, anything. And it ultimately ended where the, the judge was like, well, you, you have a clean record. This is your first incident, and I'm going to let you sign a one-year contract where if you don't break the yeah. rules of homework, school, for one year, this all goes away like nothing ever happened. Yeah. And that uh, – so I signed that, and I want to say three to six – three to five months later, um, my mother uh, told me to take the trash out. And when I refused because – as cable was back then, you had to watch something live or you had to wait, you know, two weeks or longer to see it as a rerun. I, I, I humbly asked her, can it wait until the commercial or whatever? She says, no, do it now. I just, no, and I refuse. And then she says, okay, calls the, and then she calls the police and then happily goes, um, my son has uh, violated the judge's order saying he cannot break the, oh. the, the rules of home, work, and school, and he's violated home rules by not taking out the trash. He's violated the order. Take him away, boys. Wow. That is just heavy. You know, I know, that, I know that you've told me that before, 
um, and that I still I think it's absolutely my mother. You know, my mother has done something similar years later. But, right. Uh, like, late, I don't think that she, I mean, she may have, you know, the way she's done things, but, uh, <laughs> yes. like, they, they probably think that, um, um, by, they, that you're going to be taken away for a number of hours and maybe given a court date. Like, I don't think they understand that when, when they say and do that, that you are detained until there is a court date. Well, uh, well, le yeah, let me just clarify that the police did come that day. Yeah. They took me in their squad car, put me in handcuffs, and I cried probably harder than I've ever cried in my life ever, before and yeah. after. And they just drove me around uh, the block like three times and were like, you gotta be a good boy, and then dropped me off at my house. But the damage was still done because I then still had to go to court for violating the order uh, in, in a week or two after that. Yeah. Which, which, by the way, uh, when the when the judge brought brought it up and was like, "Well, now you have to face uh, the full weight of uh, the thing because you violated yeah. it," I go, "Please save me from the abuse that I'm receiving at home. I will do anything to get out of here." And that's when he proposed uh, the group home, which yeah. a, a, was a light at the end of the tunnel to escape the abuse that I was uh, enduring at the time. Which, le let yeah. me just primarily say that the main abuse that I suffered at home was not so much the emotional uh, um, abuse or the neglect, but it was actually the uh, temperature warfare where my mother, having recently gone through postmenopause, was having you know, cold flashes or whatever, and would, would turn the heat on. It, she, would, she, she would turn the, the heat on in the summer, which yeah. me, in the opposite spectrum, going through puberty, was hot-blooded. Yeah. And, yeah, anyway. and I literally, that's actually the root of my insomnia and a lot of my mental health challenges at the time were rooted in just in trying to endure the insane temperatures that they were putting on me. And and looking back now, the most upsetting aspect of it is it could have been easily solved. Like they had a central air and heating system and right. what they could have easily done is put a window unit in my room. Yeah. Right, a, a window AC unit. And it's like, yeah. Yeah. and I'm just thinking, I'm like, one, I'm like 10 or 12 or 13 years old. I don't have money. I don't have a job. I don't even understand the concept of buying things really at this point. And, but I'm just saying like they had a, uh, they weren't rich, rich, like millionaires, but they had enough money to spend on a hundred dollars for, for a window AC unit, which would have mm -hmm. literally solved all of those problems. Everything. I, I just yeah. find that amusing that looking back, uh, how ridiculous it is that they tortured me <laughs> yeah. over temperature when the solution was clearly get me a fucking window unit. Well, it's uh, it's obviously to me. I mean, from you know, and and I heard, I remember all of this. The thermodynamic war is, is absolutely to me. It's still funny though. Uh, not funny, huh? huh? I mean, yes, oh yeah, is, yeah, I know, uh, I know what you mean. Like, it's, it's just you know uh, the mental um stress that someone can go through from something as simple as that cannot be uh understated you know what i mean like it, it, it can't and yeah that, that's the thing it, people it, probably hear that and they're like well that's a ridiculous entitled thing to be concerned right about. To, to be but like really, oh the heat on was on basis, when <laughs> right. you're really truly like trying to compromise with your with your parents and, and you have uh, uh you already have an underlying mood uh issue that 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 uh, makes control uh, uh, a primary um, concern for things, because it is for me too. It's all. Right. It was all uh, my childhood trauma, which which was about you know abandonment and emotional. Uh, well, there's neglect, and then there's a uh, you know a, a, a truly emotional warfare. I mean, sure. uh, it, it, it sounds very entitled um, because of you know. <laughs> The two of us are, let's face it, two white suburb suburban fucking males. <laughs> males, yeah. Who uh, otherwise, yeah, we had it. We had it really good. But like everyone has, everyone has whatever their situation is. Some, some, it, 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 how it affects you emotionally 
That is not well, a that is not a unique or a privileged place to be. And, right. And, and, and you know. Well, I, I was just gonna say for for me specifically with the temperature, I was unable to sleep. Which once your sleep cycle is disturbed and you have insomnia yeah. based on not being able to sleep because it's so hot, yeah. everything else in your life unravels, which it surely did right after. Yeah, I've always had. Well, for me, and because of because I have a legitimate. <laughs> bipolar diagnosis uh i i i I suffer mania which people uh, that's another thing that will be misunderstood uh where i have uh essentially limitless energy for numbers of days if if i go on i have to have a sleep medication to to take me down for sleep and sleep is so uh so important and 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 people some know and some don't like don't know how how extremely crucial sleep is especially in your developmental years and that's exactly what you're talking about oh yeah i was 12 13 years old uh when the when these issues started really climaxing which i don't know if you remember this but my mother got to the point where because i would just go down like i would reach a point of a breaking point and i'd go i have to turn the ac on and go from the yeah. heat the heat at 90 degrees in the summer to 60 or whatever degrees, oh, yeah. you know, and then my mom would come home and be like, oh, it's an ice box. Let me crank it up to 110. Like, <laughs> well, and, well, and then it culminated and she put a fucking clear lockbox over the thermostat with a key yeah. that only she could uh, change. Like a commercial fucking, oh my gosh, wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, that's, 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 that, you know, again, that's something that can't be like under, uh, uh, understated that you know that that's 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 a form of abuse period and i don't want to be like you know i'm not a whiner you know this about me i'm not you know i i know that a lot of the things that i went through were 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 well deserved but the 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 issue i think that both of us had were was that we were willing to compromise with our families, and our families just said, no, this is my house and I control. Right. We chose to have children. <laughs> and, well, you know, well, and uh, then I, if I could uh, trauma dump for a moment, I, I kind of want to segue mm-hmm. into uh, the most significant uh, portion of the abuse that I think underscores what made me who I am today. Mm. So, uh, yeah, so really, I, and here, here's actually something that is, that I don't, that I personally don't understand about myself is at one point in my life, I remembered, uh, fashion and clothes and like the, the whole idea of like, you know, high school, college, family, you know, th- that like, well, here's what I'm trying to say is I don't remember if it was a movie, if it was a TV show, if it was a commercial, somebody, you know, random on the street. But at some point I was influenced with that in mind where you need to fight the status quo and, and critically think about what you want to do and why you want to do it and not just follow the sheep's path of, you know, right. college, reproduce, die, or whatever, and I, How and I want to be interpreted amongst society. Right. Well, gotcha. and, and so at the time, uh, I'm let's say 12, 13 years old. I remember distinctly my fashion sense was Hawaiian t-shirts and basketball oh, yeah. shorts. Oh, it was so great! I loved it when you wore it. <laughs> I still do, <laughs> FYI. Well, not the Hawaiian shirts, but the basketball it shorts. Very, it was very Adam Sandler esque. Like, <laughs> yeah. Comfortable. And <laughs> well, that was the thing. I ran hot, you know, and yeah, so yeah, even yeah. in the the peak of winter yeah. in New Jersey, which got to lows of maybe twenty or thirty, like, um, still wearing yeah, I'm still wearing t-shirt and shorts. And my whole thing was, you know, anywhere I'm gonna go, I'm only gonna be outside for a few minutes, you know, or less than an hour, which I can easily persevere or even yeah. be hot afterward. Uh, so, yeah. but that that brings me to my point. My brother at the time. Uh, had a, a piano recital, and I remember they everybody got dressed up. My mom's wearing this fancy getup. My uh, my brother, my dad, they're all wearing a fancy getup, and they go, "Josh, you gotta wear a fancy getup." And I say, "No, I'm gonna wear my basketball shorts and my graphic tee, and my giant 10x, you know, uh, sweatshirt oh, or uh, you know, a coat or whatever." <laughs> Do you remember the 10x coat I got from the thrift store? Yeah. Okay, but hold on. I'm getting off course. So hold on. Um, so yeah, I, I tell them, no, 
I'm not wearing that. I reject your conformity uh, standards and I'm going to wear what I need to wear to be comfortable, even if it doesn't conform with your ideas of beauty and perfection or like what a family should be. Right. So they go, well, then I don't want you to come. And I'm like, well, I don't care what you want. I'm here to support my brother, not, you know, yeah, not conform to your, your fashion ideology. Yeah, yeah. So they can't, they couldn't stop me. They get in the car. I get in the car with them, which is a minivan, by the way, at this time. Right, right, right. They then drive. So they, they, we all get in the car. They lock up the house. Again, I'm 12 or so, maybe 13. <laughs> they lock the house up and they start driving. We go about two blocks away, three blocks away from my house, when my uh, mom says, uh, oh, we're at Ethan's friend's house. We're picking him up. Josh, get out of the car so you can help uh, load uh, this stuff in. Okay. Okay. So I get out of the car. I walk up to the, to the front door. My mom's there at the front door with me. And as soon as I get to the door, like the farthest point from the car, she, she turns around and books it back to the car, telling my dad, go, go, go. Like it's a fucking drop or, you know, like some big fucking getaway. I remember this. I remember this. Right. So, uh, so I, I, I turn around. And I book it to the car myself. When, the, and my, when my mom sees me trying to get back to the car, she turns around and then we grapple. And again, she's an adult woman and I'm like a 12-year-old boy. And she just like throws me to the ground or pushes me back. But then as soon as she, I'm on the ground and she's in the car, she goes, oh, Josh, just try to assault me or punch me or, you know, let's get out of here. And so my dad goes, oh, Josh is so out of control. Let's yeah, go. And they, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. So, so they, uh, so they take off, they take off, uh, to my brother's recital, which I don't even know where it's at because it's like, I'm a fucking child. Right. You're a kid. You don't know. I don't know. So I remember the first thing I did is I, I'm, I'm like two or three blocks from my house. So I walk home only to find it's completely locked. I don't have a key and I have no way of getting in. I have one or two neighbors that I'm familiar with. I knock on their doors. They're not there because guess what? They're at the fucking recital. I'm so sorry. No, it, well, so uh, it was at this point that I actually walk from my house to your house because I think we yeah. were friends. You weren't even home. Yeah. And so I then walk down church and I walk yeah. all the way from your house to Jesse Gordon's house by the Cherry Hill Mall. You have to also consider I'm wearing shorts and a t-shirt. And a t-shirt and a freezing cold, yeah. And I'm pretty sure I was, uh, my yeah, shoes, I yeah, I was either wearing socks or I forget what I was wearing, but I remember my feet were soaked. They were frozen. I was yeah. completely, uh, cold to my core. And by yeah. the time I got to Jesse's Gordon's house and I knocked on his door, his parents were like, oh, well, you're not allowed in here. What are you doing here? And I'm like, I'm, I need help. I'm going to die. And they, they, I remember they don't even let me in their house. They brought me like a fucking cup of like tea or like hot water and like maybe like a blanket, but probably not. And then they call my dad. And they're like, your son is here. Come get him. And he goes, oh, I'm so sorry. And I remember when I get in the car and my dad picks me up, he then lectured me, like, why are you all the way out here? And, and like, like, it was still my fault like yeah. that this was, had happened. Yeah. I, I, but I'm just saying that my objections to conformity uh, oh. were met with the most extreme abandonment and abuses that... Uh, made me double down on that sentiment. And even to this day, I refuse to... I, 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 I wear what I want to be comfortable and I, I tell anybody to get fucked if I don't care what I look like based on, on that experience. Mm -hmm. That's very well you should. Um, I think... Uh, I do remember that. I remember that happening. Uh, and that is just a... Again, once again, it's it's a it's a story about control. It's a story about. Uh, well, to me, this that's and, child and, and abuse and, and, and neglect. Like they literally abandoned me in winter, outside, yeah. like to just fend for myself as like a twelve-year-old. Yeah. Well, you know, you know what, you know what, though, you know. But uh, but I'm saying what made it worse is that they remember it as 
Oh, that was the night that that I, I assaulted my mother. That that that's how they've summarized and compartmentalized the whole night. Is oh yeah, Josh was bad. You know, you know that I identify uh, with with that kind of uh, event on a on a really deep level. You know, uh, you know that that my family also did things to to I don't want to say frame me, but it's exactly what they did. Uh, it was it was to build this picture of me uh, to not just like uh, you know my co-workers that they talk to, but um, my mother's family, which is. A, tr a tremendous influence on you know my life and 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 <laughs> again she's the oldest of 12 and she has been painting this picture of me as a, as a monster since i was uh, seven years old right. and and anything that could be spun you know history is written by the winners and when sure. you're a kid you're, you're not a winner <laughs> There's a guardianship of your family. No one, especially when they're so good at putting up that act like they have their shit together. Like, no one questions the adults in that, in that you know. No. If the kid doesn't have any bruises, then the kid's the liar. Or, the kid's not, not just that, but I remember uh, when I was in Dyfus and in the, uh, the, the group home in foster care, I would tell people about the horrors that I endured from my mother. And and yeah. people people always want to chum it up to, oh, everybody, you know, gets in fights with their mom. Oh, everybody hates right. their parents when they're younger. Right. It's like, right, right. no, she really takes the cake for, like, <laughs> biggest piece of shit I've ever met. Like, Right. Yeah. No, yeah. And, 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 and what, what it is, 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 again, like, the, not that it's downplayed. It is downplayed, but that it's... Uh, it's just so, jeez, I don't know how to say what I want to say. That, uh... Well, they wanted you to conform to an image that... When I was trying, I was trying okay. to, to, to let people know that this was a two-sided, this was a two-sided endeavor. That sure. I couldn't, like, I, like, I was, I honestly, I honestly would try to compromise with my family as far as, like, you know... Yeah, I pushed the limits. I've, I've pushed the boundaries as far as, like, what's acceptable for a minor to do. Sure. For sure I did. But as far as the recourse, as far as, um, as far as, like, what, uh, how it's going to be remembered, or what, what's going to be done about it, like, 100% of the time, um... I was I was made out to be the, the, the bad guy. It was never... Right, you were never given I, an opportunity to, to ex express your point of view or never, what you never. felt was... And yeah. I mean, never. And, it, <laughs> and since my mother was not only one of 12, she was the oldest of 12. Right. Uh, the way that I was, you know, framed to... And well, I don't mean like framed, well, like set up, but I mean framed the, the way that I was meant to look to uh, the, rest the rest of the family, of the family right. was just horrendous. And like it made my mother well, seem like a victim. Well, yeah, that, that, that's the only solution for parents that are lacking is that instead of admitting yeah. their own failures and, and faults, they instead try and save face by saying, yeah. oh, I'm the perfect parent. There's nothing wrong with me and like, everything oh, wrong with, with, with my child and poor me having to endure that. Yeah, oh, for real. Oh, yeah, Draw, the drawing of sympathy. My mother was able to... Oh man. Uh, anyway, we well, don't rest on that. Yeah, I mean, my my mom does the same thing. Where anytime my family, both on my mother and father side, at this point, I, I'm sure that I, I'm still the villain who. Uh, and, and, you know that uh, actually that's a, that's another point I want to make. Even after I uh, was in the group home and no longer living in my parents' house, anytime there was a. A, a, a tree branch uh, cracking in the backyard or, or you saw a mysterious figure walk by, I'd get a call, Josh, was that you? Are you are you in the neighborhood? Like, they were so paranoid and delusional. And I'm like, I'm fucking in another state. I'm in Trenton. I'm like hundreds of miles away. And yet, as soon as anything happens... I'm the first thing that comes to your mind. It, it's it's yeah. really sad to, to, <laughs> to see that out, like play out like that. You know, you, I mean, again, again, identify, identify so, so fucking hardly on that because, 
you know, my parents disowned me, put me into a group home at 16, and then uh, when I was 18, my birthday present from them was the restraining order. So at that point, like, what do you do as a kid? Like, as a kid, like, you throw your fucking hands up in the air and you say, well, you know, I, I admitted defeat. I was like, you know what? They win. They win. Well, I mean, what what can you do? Especially, especially a child, uh, someone eight, even if you're 18, you have no you have no resources. You you can't just be like, oh, let me spend ten thousand dollars on an attorney to look at my rights. Like, you know, it, it, it's completely ridiculous that. Uh, well, and, it's completely helpless, and and that level of helplessness versus the people that were like you know meant to as far as uh, society, our society is is is, is run. These are the people that were meant to uh, protect you. These are the people that were meant to tell you the truth. These are the people that were, so, you know, were given the task of raising you in an honorable way. And then they do the things that they did and, and, and question why, why it all turned out how it did. Like, how, how could this have happened? Right, well... We were so perfect. Uh, I outlined it all for you throughout the years. And, and so... You just, Jake, you uh, frame me as a horrible person. Right, you're framing but, me as an hor an horrible person. But uh, Jake, what am I supposed uh, to be? Right, <laughs> and again, there, there's no answer to that. I I, I just yeah. want to point out that our parents' generation, the boomers, uh, I like to refer to them as lead brained. They were <laughs> if they had to ask for the different, like at any point for leaded or unleaded or had leaded right. gas around them. Right. You gotta think, they, yeah. they were sniffing, they were, they were literally huffing gasoline as like a recreational activity, but that gasoline yeah. was fucking lead based. And so you gotta yeah. think every, like their, their plates, their cutlery, their, their yeah, cups, their, the, yeah, everything was lead. And, lead but, but that, I, again, I'm not trying to disparage a generation or discriminate against age. I'm just saying objectively, you got to think uh, almost every person who had to ask, like I said, uh, let it or unleaded it, pretty much that the, 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 the boomer generation and before, they, they are ill-equipped. They are, I mean, I mean, but just, I mean, consider this though, that, that, you know, when they go to ha have to do critical thinking or compromises or, or any of these things, they don't, they lack the capacity and it's not about intelligence or education or class. It's none of those things. It, it, it's, it's a physical reaction to being exposed to lead. And so it doesn't like, justify their horrendous actions, but it does put it in the context of we're dealing with a generation that isn't uh, at 100%. It makes it a little bit more, uh, again, like you said, not justifiable, but uh, understandable. Yes. It makes it more understandable. Yeah. Like, oh, okay, well, you know. It, it, like 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 a child, like when a toddler does something and it, he just didn't know you know he just didn't know and uh, if you look up it's either Charles or Thomas Kittering okay. uh, Kittering K I T T E R I N G uh, he was a uh, physicist who um, oh man. Was it him? I believe it was him or someone that was associated with him. He was uh, tasked with um, using um, mass spectrometers to isolate uh, uranium-235 from uranium-238. Oh, yeah, uh, the whole Oppenheimer uh, yeah, thing. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, he was, yeah, he was part of the Manhattan Project. Mm -hmm. And then, <laughs> uh, was it earlier? I believe it was earlier in life, maybe. Maybe it was later. Doesn't doesn't matter. Ir irregardless, uh, he uh, he um he was the guy that put together the Apple Corporation, which was the company that produced leaded gasoline. So he not only fried one hundred and seventy thousand Japanese people. Uh, he is solely oh. <laughs> responsible for dropping the collective IQ of uh, the globe.
Oh yeah, and 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 they did it under. Oh, uh, it's safer. It's healthier. Yeah, it's uh, more it's efficient. Better. It prevents <laughs> engine knocking. Right. Yeah. Which I'm sure it did, yeah. but at the expense of uh, everyone's IQ points. I, I think if you actually look at the graph, it it, it dropped. Yeah. The average IQ dropped about ten or twenty points. Yeah. Oh yeah. And the collective IQ drops about the same, about 10 points. And those are the people running the world right now. <laughs> That's right. Right now, yes. And uh, pretty soon it'll be us. But what's unfortunate, uh, as this is a good quote that I've heard, uh, hard times make, make soft men. strong men. Oh, uh, yeah. Strong, hard, yeah sorry. strong men make good times good times make weak men yes. weak men make hard times yes and we are uh intelligent uh but we're i feel like we we're weak are weak yes yeah we are weak yes Having never experienced war or famine or yeah, and being in the luck yeah. in the in the digital and luxury age of entertainment, we are so oh, yeah. soft and oh, we're so spoiled. So spoiled. But but it, but that same spoilage, as you said, enhanced our intelligence. Like oh, uh, sure. which I think we touched on uh, previously. That uh, not not in this conversation, but just like before that, like. Our generation is probably one of the first generations to have access to the wealth of information that the internet provided yeah. and, and actually utilize it like in a constructive yeah. and um, uh, yeah. Technically, yeah, technically, you know, my father was alive for all of that too, but his ability to uh, utilize it is well, right, because he, he as a result of not his, well, not his, not just because of lead brain, but he's an established. <laughs> <laughs> he's an established adult who has responsibilities, a career, has already been educated, and they don't have time for um, the the mo well. They don't have time for the mo or to be motivated and inspired by the boundless information at their disposal. Right, and again, my dad, my dad's not a good uh, example because he's a software engineer and because he, you know, he was so fascinated by computers, but. I'm saying my dad just because he's of that time sure. period. He, 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 um, I will not speak ill on my father. Okay, not asking. He is, a, too. He is a victim of my mother's narcissism and is, it refuses to um, acknowledge it. And that's okay because he's, he's happy and he, uh, you know, he's just a naturally spiritual man who goes through life with patience and compassion. Now, it's not to say he doesn't have an anger or temper issue, but that's uh, directly related to his espousal uh, frustration <laughs> situation. All right. Um, uh, uh, okay. This well, is just a shit on mom fucking podcast. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, the and that's that's a, that'll be the title in the description. Fuck moms. <laughs> Shit on mom. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, for real though, uh, um, yeah, no, we uh, the ability to utilize the amount of information that is at our fingertips, and I think the gratitude that we get with it is a, is what what sets us apart from Gen Z because they they have they lack the gratitude because they don't know what they didn't have. You know, right, and, and like, we were in that golden era where we actually went outside and played outside, right. and and, and, and yeah, and we we had wars on the jungle gym, and we yeah, fucking you know what I mean. We, but it was like a sense that. of community where you naturally figure out your place oh, in the community, right. like right. your you know, and it was based right. on power, strength, bigness, like, you know, it was these factors which get eroded when everyone's trying to be woke and, you know, right. concerned about everything. It's like, we're primal. Like, you know, yeah. we're, we're, we're talking we're about, right uh, right what's that movie or book, uh, of the flies? Um, Lord of the flies. Lord yeah. of the flies. I, I'm saying that is a, is a stern example of like, that's yeah. what we, we become as soon as parents and civilization go away and civilization goes away yeah, but, right but I, I'm just hinting at the bigger point that and savages and savage, yes so my, my my point though is that we were <laughs> what is we, your point? <laughs> well is that we're a very unique generation in that we were there yeah. for the traditional 
uh, values or, uh, yeah. or or dynamics that play that should be playing out naturally, which have yeah. since been uh, put under the light of wokeness or. Uh, yeah. You, you know, where, where again, it's like, I'm not trying to disparage anybody, but like there, there is a natural, there's a natural benefit to being put in your place and understanding, oh, I can't oh, yeah. fight this guy or I can't, you know, or, yeah, you know, I'll have to, knowing your limitations it's an, a, it's an important life lesson that I think has oh, since yeah. been lost because instead of people figuring out in real life on the playground, People are, are are trying to figure that out on chat rooms and on Instagram yeah, and TikTok, yeah, and where it's it's not natural. By, uh, that kind of separation, and that's the vibe, man. Uh, it was interesting, and here comes my hippy dippy kind of point of view, man. Is <laughs> all of your sensory perceptions, all of your senses, um, come through in waves. We uh, receive information via the wave. Okay. Uh, everything no. has a frequency. Um, uh, uh, Jake, uh, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't want to uh, diminish that or, or challenge that at all. I, I'm not. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But uh, I, I did actually want to touch on a recent, uh, recent. Uh, I don't want to call it revelation, but uh, con- conclusion. I, I I came to. Okay. Uh, have you ever heard of a philosophy called hard determinism? Hard determinism. No, I, I know determinism. I know determinism. So, so yeah, uh, can you just briefly like uh, describe or define what what your current determinism? understanding is? Okay. Yes. Determinism is the uh, the concept that everything everything is for um, for for uh, how do I say it? For orchestrated. It is uh, all of it. Everything that happens, it happens. Uh, it's called a predestiny. It's uh, predestined, all of it. Uh, that you, every single thought that you have is a result. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Every thought that you have is a result of your genetics and the electrical impulses and signals that are sent through your brain, which were, um, you know, right. okay. determined, de- determined um, forever ago at the beginning of all of this. Right. So well, what you can... Re- all of your decisions, your uh, actions, your reactions, everything that you do is a result of natural heredity and environment, which were, uh, again, uh, predestined. They were arranged right. So n- yeah. th- let me please clarify uh, what I've been working on. Uh, and, and I, at first, when I first came to this conclusion and started putting this together, my original uh, motivation was to submit this in a uh, jur- in, in a um, in, in a journal, such as uh, you know, there's like scientific journals, but yeah. it would be like a philosophical journal. Uh, I, I have since found that that is not the best course of action because a lot of these journals uh, actually take full copyright and uh, ownership of whatever you submit to them. And I think instead, uh, instead, since I'm not an academic, I'd rather just maybe publish it as a book to sell to, to other individuals instead of uh, in a journal like that. So but so that's where that's where um, there's a tight spot there uh because we don't have the accreditation necessary that's why i'm doing the schooling for what i'm doing is so that i can go through let's say the new england journal of medicine and have that kind of um social backing sure so uh, before we get to off course i just want to explain hard determinism in 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 my conclusions therein um hard determinism kind of takes it one step further where I think what you were describing as like a loose fate of like, you know, everything kind of leads into like a deterministic fashion it is, is somewhat looser and is, is referred to as soft determinalism where you still have agency and you still can make decisions or have, uh, can do that. Shift your timeline with your intentions and shit. So, uh, Hard determinalism is essentially saying uh, that everything is physics and that just, you know how there's the uh, the billiard ball or pool table kind of uh, scenario where you know if you hit a ball at this angle, you can predetermine where it's going to go and what it's going to hit. And, right, and, and the limitations of that are, are 
based on our understanding of physics and everything yeah. else. So, but what I'm trying to say is, since the beginning of the Big Bang, everything right. has been deterministic. We, right. as humans, lack the ability to calculate and determine what's going to happen in the future. But that doesn't mean it's not. That doesn't mean it's not calculatable or determinable in that we are we understand just like the billiard balls that they're a f they're uh they're bound by the laws of physics right. and we understand that this mass at this velocity will go this way for this long and it'll bounce right. off at this angle right, right. a lot of physics we do know and there are, we're discovering more and more that, those so, that we don't but go ahead right so what i'm leading to though is ultimately um we uh being sentient beings uh, yeah. are still made of um, uh, of the elements and physics and physical components that are, are bound by the laws of nature and therefore can be calculated uh, and yeah. determined. Yeah. Have, so, you seen, dude, have you seen devs or otherwise devs? Yes, I, I, yes, I have, and how they can kind of control the future or know what everybody's going to do and then still plan around yeah. it. I, I'm, I'm very familiar dude, with the concept. What an amazing fucking program. Uh, shameless, sh shameless plug here. Uh, in that, 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 that miniseries is one of the greatest things I've ever seen in my life. Okay, so I, I just, I, I, well, I have a document here that basically says the case for hard determinism, and, it, and, it, and it's a very comprehensive uh, document, but I, I just want to read one section of it about luck. Okay. One second. Luck, go ahead. Luck is interesting. All right, I like this. What does determinism have to say about luck? <sighs> What did her daddy do? Okay. The, it, so, it, so this is on like page 10 or something here, but it, it, the, the title is The Illusion of Luck, A Case for Determinism. Ooh. One of the most intriguing, I'm just going to read it like verbatim. <laughs> One of the most intriguing arguments against determinism arises from the human experience of luck. Those seemingly improbable occurrences that defy the odds shaking our belief in the predictability of events, from the inexplicable success of a, of a risky venture to a miraculous escape from a near-fatal situation. Luck presents... Luck presents as an enigma, inviting the suggestion that not everything in the, in the universe can be explained by cause and effect alone. However... A closer examination of luck reveals it to not be an exception of determinism, but rather a compelling argument in its favor. The matter lies in the way we interpret probability. When an event has a 0 0.0001 chance of happening, and then that thing actually occurs, it challenges our initial assumptions. Yet in the moment that it occurs, the event's probability shifts from being nearly impossible to being absolutely certain. That is uh, uh, that that improbability was an illusion born out of our limited understandings of the variables at play. The realization that what we consider luck is essentially a deterministic outcome cloaked in the guise of improbability has profound implications for how we understand the nature of existence. It emphasizes that the universe, in all its complexity, operates on a web of causality so intricate that our current model can only approximate, uh, approximate outcomes, not predict them with absolute certainty. And luck, then, becomes a testament to our limitations in understanding this intricate web, rather than uh, evidence of its non-existence. Oh, I love it. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to kind of touch on that. I have a whole paper, I'm going to go about it, but, but it basically says, you know, why do we think we as humans are uh, exempt from the laws of physics? We, we, we seem to think that because we're conscious, that because we have um, the illusion of free will, that yeah. that somehow uh, makes us special or unique that we are not to be calculated in, uh, in, these, in these things because of our perceived illusion of decision. So, 100% uh, is the arrogance of man. Uh, some call it hubris. Um, 
It is, uh, we are the only, uh, you know, that we know of um, animal that uh, engages and relies heavily upon our prefrontal cortex. And that yes. uh, part of the brain is in charge of logical thinking, executive decision functioning, irony, and humor. Uh, these are, this is, I'm not reading this from anything. This is uh, just what I remember. And um, what we do is, it, it, it's what separated us from the rest of the animal kingdom, uh, the ability to communicate and work with one another and the ability to reason and... Okay, uh, uh, Jake, can, can I just... Uh, I, I just want to interject briefly because I actually have a section in here that addresses the prefrontal cortex in relation to hard determinism. Okay, yeah. Okay, uh, it says... Um, it, the title is The U Unique Cognitive Capabilities of Humans from Survival yeah. to Existential Inquiry. Human, hu oh, yeah. <laughs> humans stand apart from other species due to the extraordinary capabilities of their prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain yeah. responsible for complex thought and planning. This cognitive machinery allows our ancestors to engage in predictive modeling, offering them survival advantages in perilous environments. For instance, early humans could simulate different scenarios to determine the efficiency of using a spear against a predator as opposed to relying on their bare hands. This capacity for running mental simulations also, underpin, also underpins our perception of free will. We delight in imagining alternative realities, giving us the illusion that we are making choices among various possible outcomes. This, this cognitive feature, though evolutionary beneficial, has far-reaching implications that extend beyond the immediate needs for survival. One, one unintended consequence of this cognitive power is the human propensity for pattern recognition, which manifests in various forms such as biases, prejudices, and even cliches. Because, because humans are predisposed to draw conclusions based on past experiences and over, or observations, this pattern recognition can at times skew our judgment, influencing both individual behavior and societal norms. In a modern world, far removed from life and death struggles of the jungle, this ability to recognize patterns... Are you good? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, the, uh, far removed from the life and death struggles of the jungle, this ability to recognize patterns and predict outcomes has been repurposed for more abstract considerations. Instead of focusing solely on immediate survival, humans now wield their cognitive faculties to delve deeper into the meaning of existence, pondering, pondering complex issues that range from morality to the nature of time itself. This cognitive leap presents a conundrum where we reconsider notions of determinism and free will. The very ability that allows us to contemplate these philosophical constructs might be responsible for our perceived sense of agency. Are we then prisoners of our evolved neural architecture or do we genuinely possess the free will that our brains lead us to believe we have? Oh, that's good. That's good. So I, uh, I am of the school, uh, the former. I believe that we uh, have, because of that prefrontal cortex, uh, I use the word arrogance, um, but to think that we are special or separate from, you know, a colony of, uh, let's say, soldier ants or whatever. Right. They were you know a hive mind uh they communicate with one another on some level uh all of them know their role and what capacity they are supposed to execute it and uh i think that we have you know because we have uh rendered ourselves so very uh <laughs> so very free of a lot of time consuming activities such as hunting gathering uh you know we don't even each individually, uh, you know, grow or um, cultivate uh, our own. We don't incubate our own animals. We have a, 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 a farmer or farmers. We have a whole system put together that um, <laughs> renders us ir unresponsible. Irresponsible. Okay. Right. However you want to look okay. at it. Uh, um, and, and I think that, uh, I, again, I, I'm, I'm with the former. I believe that we have 
removed ourselves from certain responsibilities that are natural in uh, in order, <laughs> um, and that we then utilize that time to question things that are more or less none of our business, you know? Okay. Like, uh, I love the phrase, the illusion of free will. Yes. Uh, I love the... The respect so, that whoever, whomever wrote this is, is giving to the idea that we are less important than we believe we are. Uh, but um, dare I talk about the spiritual side of things? Uh, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, well, actually, I have a section here about the practical implications of hard determinism in a modern society and a clarification on some common misconceptions and, and criticisms because when I tried talking to Jason about hard determinism, he, yeah. he basically was like, oh, well, if I don't have uh, agency or free will, then I can't be held accountable and I can just go murder and, and rape or right. do, you know, and, right. and it's, and it's like, it's He's using an extreme point to get across a simple idea. Right. But what I wanted to, if you'll allow me, I just want to read uh, right. some, some of this stuff. Okay. <laughs> So again, th this is the implications uh, in a modern society and a clarification on these points. So I'm just going to read it. While hard determinism may seem to negate the very essence of human freedom, choice, and morality, it does not necessarily undermine the richness and complexity of the human experience. This, uh, I, I aim not to devalue the decisions we make, the ethics we hold, or the moral dilemmas we wrestle with, Rather, it seeks to contextualize these phenomena within a deterministic framework. Okay. So I have a section here for individuality and choices. Even if free will is an illusion, the decisions we make are real in the sense that they are um, phenomenological experiences that define our individuality. Our thoughts, emotions, and actions continue to shape our lives, give us purpose, and contribute to a sense of self. Now I have a section on accountability and justice. Determinalism, determinalism does not absolve us from holding others accountable for their actions. In a deterministic universe, our legal and moral systems would, not, not just, would serve not just as punitive measures, but as societal mechanisms for prevention and rehabilitation. Understanding why an action took place is crucial for ensuring it does not uh, recur again or is actively uh, discouraged or encouraged based on its societal impact. Uh, this is a part on morality and ethics. Determinism does not invalidate morality. Rather, it offers a framework to understand why we make certain ethical decisions. Our moral compass still functions. It's just not free from casual... I don't know what that word is. Uh, ethical delib uh, deliberation remains a vital aspect of human interaction, even if the outcome is predetermined. Huh. Um, uh, uh, hold on. Let me think about okay. that. Uh, so, I do like uh, that <laughs> we, we, do, we do have... Uh, uh, we hold what we believe to be a moral obligation to hold one another accountable. Uh, I, I like to think that, you know, at the end of the day, especially the way that society is, is, is uh, arranged right now, <laughs> that it, it, I have to hold myself accountable. And that is, um, I believe, I believe, at least for me, that it's more important um, as far as, but as, but as far as, as far as it concerns determinism um, or hard determinism, um, it's hard to say whether or not I am choosing the right level of, account of, of accountability to hold myself to. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> if it were all predestined, if all of this were foretold, if all of it was, you know, is, is, is a result of, of, of particles bumping into uh, right. one another and, and yep. doing the things that they were going to do anyway. Yep. Well, well, then there'd be no point for morality. No, um, let, let me... Because let... we would be doing the same damn things. <sighs> but I think it makes the experience, as, as I do believe that we are just the universe experiencing itself. 
Uh, yeah. I think it makes the experience that the universe is having with itself a little bit more uh, juicy. <laughs> Okay. It makes it <laughs> well, I, I just want to give you a conclusionary statement. Uh, like this, this is a this is a long paper that I have drafted here, but uh, Did you one, write this? oh yeah, I wrote this. Oh no shit! How about that? Um, with the help of AI. Um, yeah. But no. yeah. So uh, there's a section here on the inescapability of causality. It's important to note that everything in our universe, from the Big Bang to its eventual heat death is part of a casual chain. This does not mean life is meaningless. Rather, it Im implies that everything that could happen will have a 100% chance of happening based on prior conditions. We are all part of an inescapable web of causality, and our actions, however predetermined, contribute to the unfolding of the universe. Yeah. Did you disconnect? What? Oh, there you are. Okay. Okay, so, wait, so, regardless of whether or not they are acknowledged, they play a part towards the unfolding of... Yeah, and I, I, I agree with that. I think it doesn't matter what you believe <laughs> uh, as far as, like, uh, uh, how it's going to go anyway. Yeah, I, 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 tr I truly believe that. I think, uh, you know, you're <laughs> first of all, fuck your feelings, <laughs> you know. Uh... <laughs> And it's unfortunate, but, like, uh, life's not fair. We know that. Um, it's just not. Uh, and the bigger picture, uh, oh. I, 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 we can't, I can't see it. Uh, I assume you can't see it. Uh, well, I, I think I have a very, uh, when, when, when you touched on um, morals and, and some, some other thing, I, I have one last section I'd, I'd really like to read for you, if that's okay. Okay. So this is, this is called Determinism, Integrity, and Moral Imperative. Okay. Determinism, Integrity, and Moral Imperative. Yes. All right. Okay. Here. Um, so uh, hard determinism with its premise of preordained events could ostensibly diminish the value of individual agency. Yet amidst the de this deterministic matrix, there exists an undeniable resonance of personal conviction and moral fortitude. Even within the constraints of determinism, certain individuals driven by profound beliefs navigate their past with unwavering resolve. Consider Buddha, a, a paragon of purity and purpose. Despite the in inexorable pull of determinism, his choices reflected a life lived with clarity and intention. Such an individual remains... Um, I can't read that. Uh, um, not because of immunity from the universe's deterministic forces, but due to an inner alignment of what is righteous and just. When one's actions stem from a place of deep moral conviction, it feels as if the universe itself yields, offering a path of least resistance. It's akin yeah. to sensing a cosmic endorsement, an, af an affirmation that the chosen direction is harmonious with the broader rhythm of existence. Ooh, I like that. Such action breathes easier, resonates deeper, and impacts more profoundly. Right. Yet, it's important to acknowledge the complexities of human motivation. There are instances where individuals feeling suppressed may be perceived and, and perceive injustices resort to actions that others might deem radical or extreme. From a deterministic lens, their life trajectory have culminated in these moments of heightened resolve. For them, their actions feel not only justified, but almost predestined. They act not out of capri, uh, caprice, uh, but from profound sense of urgency shaped by the intricate tapestry of their past experiences. Yeah. Exceptions certainly exist, particularly when considering individuals with uh, cognitive and uh, psychi psychological impairments. Their capacity to reason and align their actions with ethical principles may be compromised. However, for the majority, their actions, even if viewed as contentious by some, stem from a genuine belief in their moral rectitude. Hmm. In a universe governed by deterministic principles, personal integrity and convictions shine as beacons of human resilience. They stand testament to the human spirit, capacity to seek justice, truth, and meaning, even when the broader cosmos might seem indifferent to individual endeavors. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
like that. Well, I and, like that a lot. Well, and I, I kind of, you know, there's that recent um, stuff with Israel and Palestine where mm-hmm. everyone's like, oh, this... Recent, but I know what you mean. Well, I, I, I don't want to take sides. I'm just saying the people that we perceive as terrorists or extreme, we don't know uh, yeah. what their lives were and what culminated in them needing to do this. Right. I, I, my, my brain, that's the first place my brain went, of course. It's the most extreme example that we have right now uh, in regards to uh, that, that uh, in, in, in whether or not they see what they're doing as just. Uh, some of them feel like there is no other option, you know. Um, but, but, yeah, uh, so let's not get into, uh, well... Uh, whatever it would be. Um, um, I don't want to sit and say they're right, they're wrong. Well, it's not a war that's been going on. For right, but it, again, it's not about them or this specific situation. It's just about putting about, yeah, things that we... Who have can strong, strong convictions can see what they're doing as having being predestined, and I don't disagree. Well, don't, it's, not, it's not about them being predestined. It's that the, the culmination of the events in their life led them to do these yeah, things that right. we see as extreme, but if we experience the same thing as them, if, if we experience the same thing as them, how could we ever act any differently? Right, right, and, 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 and it's tough. It's tough to, to hear, to think about well, that. Well, yeah, people don't like hearing it because they go, you know, people want to make a, a case for, oh, Hitler or, you know, these terrorists and stuff, and it's like, but again, we don't know everything that Hitler experienced or everything a terrorist experienced or anybody else experienced and we're drawing these conclusions based on media or indoctrination or how the things are written and we never actually really know what somebody was thinking or their motivation or their experiences that led them to do the things that they do whether it's good or bad and I agree with and understand where you're coming from, but again, uh, talking on this, we, I think we should speak very, very gingerly on this topic. Oh yeah, we, we, don't, we can... The reason being, <laughs> yes. and again, uh, Josh comes from a, a Jewish background. I am Jewish. Uh, so it's not... Uh, and I'm not condoning... No sympathizing with Hitler. Yeah, uh, I, yeah I'm not just, sympathizing just or justifying or... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you're just framing the point uh, in, in, in the most, uh, well, what I would say is, it's like uh, certain situations that you could talk about this being uh, applied to that would look like you were writing it in pencil, and the Hitler point comes out in deep, bold, highlight. You know, well, right, that, that's where pe- people ha- have a habit of, of referencing extremes, and yes, I felt it uh, necessary to explain or at least touch on some of these yeah. extremes in that, you know, I'm not justifying or condoning any of these actions. I'm just putting them in, th- in the perspective of hard determinism. Right, right, right. And that's, that's kind of what I was going to, that's what I meant to, that's how I wanted to say it. So thank you. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, no, I, I, uh, hard determinism and determinism, how very interesting that they are different topics. I think, uh, you know, you're either determinalistic or you are a determinist or you're not. You know? Well, I think I, I, the difference is some people believe that the universe is deterministic in general, but that humans are an exception and that will, our free will, that our free will lets us... Uh, but hard determinism says that there is no free will and that it's everything that's ever happened had a hundred percent chance of that happening. Chance of happening. Right. I, uh, okay. 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 So I am a believer in timelines. I am. Right. I believe that. Uh, I believe that the decisions that we make uh, impact the life that we live. Of course. I believe that. Yeah. Um, I believe that. Um, <laughs> However, <laughs> I, uh, I also believe that that is less um, imperative than I think it is even. <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? What, no, what, what do you mean by that? Okay, I think that... I think that... Uh, karma, let's say. Uh, I have the, a section about karma as well, by the way. Yeah, so <laughs> the... the, the <laughs> If I do good, good things will happen. Well, I believe in that, but they, they won't necessarily happen to me. You know, that karma, karma is is more of a, 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 a 
a shared experience karma is that if I do good, good will happen somewhere in the world. The collective frequency is affected. Yes. Um, you know, uh, when 9-11 happened, a uh, day or two thereafter, there was a moment of silence where they asked everyone in the country to be just silent for, I don't remember, a minute or three minutes, something like that. And on that day, global crime was, it dropped 50%. Let me say that again. On that day, after three minutes were spent with a positive intention, global crime dropped 50%. Meaning people who are not even American, people who are not even aware that it happened uh, <laughs> anywhere, globally, it dropped 50%. Um, and that that is kind of the idea between do 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 good and good will happen not necessarily anyway uh the choices that i make have uh, an impact on my timeline my timeline and that may impact may or may not impact uh the experience of others however <laughs> this is where it gets interesting if you had made different choices in your life here or here or there or here or there you may not have put yourself in a position to be subject to the decisions that I made. Sure. Does that make sense? Well, I think what you're ultimately saying is that we're all connected and that the, the yeah. actions that we make seem to ripple through the universe, even in ways that we can't directly connect or see uh, ourselves. 110%. And I think, and I think it's even more... Uh, elaborate or intricate than uh, I'm even able to uh, convey because of uh, what we know or what, what little we know about quantum mechanics. Oh, I, I have a engineering. Oh, I have a whole section on quantum. Uh, <laughs> Which quantum what? Because there's so. Uh, I have a yeah. Hold on. Um, uh, yeah, let, 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 let me just let me just read it real quick, and then and then we can kind of wrap it up a little bit after that because we're we're almost at the two hour mark. So, uh, quantum randomness. The question about whether quantum ran randomness challenges a deterministic view in our in our universe is a matter of ongoing debate in both physics and philosophy. Yeah. In classic physics, determinism holds quite well. If you know the initial conditions of a system, you can predict its future behavior. However, in quantum mechanics, particles do not have definitive positions or velocities until they are observed. Right. Instead, they exist in superposition of all possible states. Right. When a measurement is made, the, par the particle, quote, chooses one of the possible outcomes seemingly at random. This process is inherently probab this process is inherently probabilistic and not deterministic. According to most popular interpretations of qu quantum mechanics, called the Copenhagen interpretation, some, yeah. some argue that the inherent randomness at the quantum level introduces a form of indeterminate indeterminacy that challenges a deterministic view of the universe. If the behavior of a particle is probabilistic and not strictly determined, then, in theory, events at the macroscopic level could also be influenced by this randomness, leading to a form of quantum indeterminism. Right. Others argue that this randomness doesn't necess necess necessarily negate determinism at the macroscopic level, where no. classical physics dominates. Yeah. There are also alternative interpretations of quantum mechanics, like the many worlds interpretation, which are fully deterministic, but at the cost of assuming that every possible outcome of a quantum measurement actually occurs in a separate, non- no. Uh, non-communicating parallel universe. Yes, so, this is what I believe. But I just, one last sentence. So whether quantum randomness, randomness challenges determinism depends on your perspective and which interpretation of quantum mechanics you, su you subscribe to. Yes, okay. So that's the one that I, I subscribe to. But, but, well, but, but Jake, just my, my closing statement on that is we're talking about a system we don't understand and, and lack the ability to measure, which is essentially the whole point of determinism is explaining we try to predict the world and we fail. 
just because we lack the technology or mental uh, abilities to predict accurately or uh, view these quantum or micro events uh, in full doesn't mean that they're not that they wouldn't happen in exactly the same way or hundred percent type of situation yeah. that the terminalism okay. uh, would you know uh, cover prescribe yeah <laughs> yeah cover it yeah. So, okay, the reason that we discuss things like this is because we don't fully understand them. Uh, well, and, 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 well, actually, Jake, I, I, I'm sorry I keep interrupting, but I just wanted to really touch on the future. Uh, I, I have a section here about emerging technologies, AI, quantum computers, and the horizon of determinism. Uh, okay. While this, uh, while I mostly discuss hard determinism in the context of existing scientific knowledge, it is important to note that emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, quantum computing, could offer groundbreaking insights into our understanding of determinism. These advancements might even bring us closer to the ability to run complex simulations that could expose our current timeline with unprecedented accuracy. Yes. The notion is not too far-fetched. Uh, hypothetically speaking, if we develop sufficient algorithms and computing power, we could generate models to predict future events with near-perfect accuracy. This yeah. idea flirts with the notion of simulation theory, which posits that it is, if it's possible to simulate a universe, then it's statistically probable that we're already in a simulated one. Yeah. While, the, while the current paper here that I'm reading from doesn't de delve into this theory, its implication, implications for the subject matter are noteworthy. More, mm -hmm. Moreover, the technology feats could give rise to a paradoxical dilemma. If a machine can predict future events with 100% accuracy, then knowing our future might become part of that predetermined path. This yeah. introduces a convoluted question of whether revealing such information would allow us to alter our timeline. However, this quandary may be illusionary. Even if we were to act on information about the future, our actions would still be part of the deterministic framework. This yeah. paradox leads to heightened anxiety among people who, upon learning of their predetermined futures, attempt to regain control. Ironically, yeah. their attempt to steer away from the re revealed path could also be part of the deterministic sequence of events. Essentially, our efforts to understand or control these complexities would still be constrained by our, by our limited human experience and cognitive capacities, and would therefore not liberate us from the deterministic past that we're on. Thusly, the advance of technology does not necessarily negate hard determinism, but may instead offer new avenues for understanding its complexities and implications. You remember the movie Big Fish? I actually never saw it, but I know you talked about devs, which is pretty much hit the nail on the head with, you know, yeah. trying to control a timeline and still be in it. Well, in the, in the movie Big Fish, the father, uh, who the, the whole movie is about, it's about him describing his life and his son essentially not believing right. the quote-unquote yes. I, I might have actually seen some tell, of this. But, yeah, it sounds familiar. Sorry. Uh, you know, throughout the movie, it kind of it's kind of like Slumdog Millionaire in that <laughs> all of these uh, tall tales are verified throughout the movie. However, that's not the point. I digress. His father uh, lived such an interesting life because he met with a witch when he was a kid, and the, the witch asked, "Do you want to see the moment that you die?" Right? Okay. And and he said, "Yeah." So he looks into her eye, and it. You know, he sees through the witch's eye how he's going to die. You don't see it in right, that moment. Right. But the point is, he went through his life fearlessly from there on out because he knew, well, this isn't what's going to kill me. Well, this isn't what's going to kill If I jump right. off this bridge, that's not, what, that's not what's going to kill me. Sure, you know? right. And uh, that just kind of, that kind of... Uh, is what that's what it made me think when um when you think about a, a quantum computer putting together you know however many billions of scenarios because uh, that's what, that's really what it's talking about it's not that you know if we see the future that we can we change it as a result and the answer would be no 
But, but you can, uh, I, again, what I believe, and, and, and it's in the multiverse theory, is that, you know, any choice that I make alters the timeline that I exist upon, uh, or exist within. Uh, and I believe that all potential possibilities, and, 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 and this is why, you know, the living in a simulation thing is so very interesting to me, is that, okay, first of all, we built a quantum computer under the assumption that quantum mechanics and superposition were true. Well, and we have it functioning. It's 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 working. So we. I know, I know, I know. That's that's my point. Okay. Is that it was theorized. It was uh, it was acted upon, and it has, as of yet, been uh, been efficient. So it's uh, it's like we it's like we went ahead and built. Uh, you know. I don't know how to describe. It. I don't know what to, uh like build a house out of glass. Okay. And just assume that it wasn't going to break. <laughs> okay. And we were fucking right, you know? Uh, <laughs> and and it's, it's a, truly a miracle. Um, and the elaborate, the elaboracy of of the uh, quantum computers that are coming out. Like, you can, I can just, I can just see it uh, that, you know, soon enough, uh, we will have the computing power necessary to simulate a universe. Sure. Will it be as elaborate as this one? I mean, not over the next, not in a hundred years, but in two thousand years. Yeah. Well, and yeah. well, and you're also <laughs> kind of dis discounting the potential exponential growth of uh, right. artificial intelligence if it actually becomes right. self-aware or wants to actively help yeah. us do these things. Then it can take that you know thousand-year time frame and make it till you know two years from now. Next week. Yeah, yeah next, next week. Thursday. <laughs> Uh, uh, done by next Thursday. Well, yeah, AI is uh, is 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 also some more well somewhat affected by the human capacity to uh, develop the uh, quantum computer strong enough to allow it to do what it needs to to create a a simulation. Now, well, um, well Jake, I just want to so really like, quickly so touch like, on the likelihood that okay. we're living in a simulation is. Like uh, something like ninety nine point. Yeah, they're they're, they're science, right? some scientists are like a hundred percent sure, basically. Yeah, yeah. But but I, I guess my point is, what would it actually change about our lives or our meanings? Like just because our, like I guess what I'm trying to say is, even if it's in a simulation, that that means that there's a a base reality that exists outside yeah. of that. There's a base reality out there. Right. I yeah. Even if you believe in simulation theory, there you that ultimately means you still believe in a base reality. What, what I'm trying to say is even if our life is a simulation or every the whole universe is, it doesn't make our lives any less rich or our human experience no. any less important to us and, and might still align with the broader religious implications of God and afterlife. Like we might, yeah. not that I personally believe in it, but I'm just saying just because we're simulated doesn't mean we you know, aren't real in that we can experience to, these things. Who's to say that the afterlife isn't a part of the simulation? Like well, I, here, well, yeah, now we're just kind of speculating again. But I, I guess my, my whole point, though, is, like, even if, like, what's the point of proving it or even disproving it? Uh, okay, we're in base reality. What's the difference? Right. Oh, we're in a simulation. What's the difference? Like, it's right. not It's not like, oh, now that I know I'm in a simulation, let me do R1, R2, L1, L2, fucking yeah, yeah, put in yeah. a GTA fucking cheat code, and now I have a million dollars in my bank account. Like, that's not how reality works, simulation or not. <laughs> however, uh, however, Jake, I did want to touch on a very niche uh, topic of Total Recall. Do you remember that movie? Yeah, of course. Well, the whole premise is a, a person can experience a simulation that is indiscernible from reality. Okay. So yeah. how would I, like, just, I'm saying, let's say I'm, let's say the real Josh in base reality is is putting himself in a total recall type of uh, simulation. And I, right. you know, programmed it to be, oh, you're, you're going to be Josh and you're going to have a tough life and you're going to fight for justice and going to be this red I'm, I'm saying how would i even know and does that even limit or take away from the richness of my experience so uh 
I guess the answer there would be whether or not at the beginning of it you chose to know. You know, I think that you could put in before you enter this 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 completely accurate uh, simulation. Before you enter this completely accurate simulation and um, lived your life as a, a, in accordance with it. I think that that would be part of the setup. I think you would uh, choose whether or not you could recall the fact that you're that you're doing that. Well, or, well I mean, I guess let's let's just put it in two two uh, two possible other, scenarios. But the other answer, my other answer is no. I don't think it would. I don't think it would make a difference. I think that you know the experience that I have had. Well, he, he, in, in this reality, whether it's simulated or not has been just as righteous, just as fulfilling, just as uh, real to me as it would be otherwise. I had a girlfriend, uh, Tempest, who said there is only truth. Uh, and uh, I didn't know why I said, you're such a fucking... You think it'd be <laughs> yeah. Okay. Doing right. Chakra fort and, uh, you know, an astrologist. And uh, but what she meant by that was like, this is your this is your chance. This is your choice whether or not to care or not. And like I had a, a not an argument but a debate with her over that. I said I can't I can't choose uh, to care. Like it's I, I have a, a like a blocker in me that just makes it Im I can, it's impossible for me to apply well, any level of sympathy well, or empathy towards towards this right or that. right. Well, um, and she, and yeah. she was right, and I was wrong. Well, I guess what I was gonna say though is c consider the consider the scenario where you, the base you or me, chooses to go into a uh, a total recall or simulation, but but now now put it in in the, in the thought or context of you choose to not have your prior knowledge or experience. And you choose to set certain levels of difficulty or hardship. Now, right. also put this into the scenario that what if our the base the base us is actually in um, like let's just say the base us is in the what we would consider the future, where it's right. the metaverse where you are your consciousness has been uploaded to to a to AI or a machine, and now right. you can run unlimited countless scenarios where you can live every possible uh, life that you could ever want to live under every possible condition and it's just playing out. Okay. I'm saying, I, I guess that's my point is uh, my, uh, my autistic self in being able to objectively kind of break down reality. I, I felt that certain things almost have a numerical value where I go, wow, my, my settings today seem like they're on a seven out of 10 in hardness right. on certain okay. things. Interesting. Well, and I guess that's what I'm trying to say is what would the implications of realizing or knowing if you're in a simulation? Like even if you follow the movie, like eventually he gets out of the simulation, uh, but only to find himself in grave peril. And then again, he, and then again, uh, the um, bad guys make him question, are, are you still in the simulation? You're still, you're, yeah, you're still yeah. sleeping, you know? I, I guess yeah. what I'm saying is, you know, determinism or not, uh, our lives or not, it, it, it's, it's, I, I find um, patterns in certain levels of complexity and in certain aspects of my life that I can quantify in a numerical value, like I said, due to my autis autism. But um, I, I just wanted to what consider or hear your response to that. Uh, if such a scenario was true, if our base selves are living in, in the future and we're running and this is just one of billions of simulations that each one of us get to individually experience. So... Uh, well, you and I have a, a, a similarity there, and mine doesn't come from autism. But we are, there's two different ways to go about life. One is uh, perception, and the other is perspective. So sure, perception sure. is yeah, what perception you see. Is when a person perceives things from their point of view, and they have 
that's what they have. They have their universe because of their feelings, thoughts, experiences, experiences and yes. environment. Their, uh, their lives are their own, and they concern themselves with the way that they're looking at things, okay? Right. And then there's you and I who have perspective, which means we're able to step back and objectively consider how uh, we are looking at things and how others are uh, looking at things. And we can see that... Um, we can see the difference in, in, in how we think and the decisions that we make when we do that as opposed to when we are emotionally involved in our decision-making process and we, and we um, essentially submit or secede to, to, uh, uh, to forego logic and to uh, take on life emotionally. And both of us have done sure. that in, of course. in more than one occasion. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that we don't have the ability to do that. Now, that should, in a way, answer it. But that means that we are humans, and we are experiencing such radical emotions that we forego the logical decision-making, the executive decision, you know, the executive right. functioning of our brains. So I believe that... Uh, Huh. Again, I, I, I still side with the multiverse theory okay. in that every every possibility is ha happening, has happened, and will happen forever. Uh, we perceive, and this is not perspective, we perceive time as being a linear function. Sure, regardless. of course. And, 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 and it takes perspective to understand that. Sure. But... But as life goes, we are we we are submitted to uh, beginning, middle, and end. We are submitted well, to. We can per we have that perspective, but w what I find fascinating is we're always in the present. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is an interesting thing. Uh, Though we like to think in the past and future, we are never outside of the present. Right. Well, I mean. <laughs> to break it down and get a little more freaky deaky is that you know we are not our bodies you know well yeah we're the culmination of uh non-living parts yeah that. we are not our <laughs> thoughts we are the thinker of our thoughts you know well yeah i mean i i align with what you were saying about the universe uh experiencing itself i, I find that yeah. to be a very uh, good uh, simplification of itself in that everything that we are, our physical being, uh, was all forged in stars and is all part of the yeah. singularity that was once the Big Bang. And yeah. to say that we're not or we're special or my thoughts or my free will uh, right. take take us out of that is, is folly. Yeah, it is folly. Uh, yeah, but that's, again, it goes along with the arrogance of man. Yeah, we well, it, 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 it's it's about we ego the where we. It's arrogant enough to think that we can consider why we're here. And, but and, and 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 hold on, and I think that might uh, actually be uh, along the lines of my answer, <laughs> is that if I were to be as arrogant as man is, and to think that, um, you know, whether or not we're in a simulation, whether or not it is deterministic, and whether or not. That's going to impact my life day to day, um, uh, year to year. H h however, um, that, that, that that's that's me flexing a level of arrogance that is unhealthy, more than unhealthy. My job is to, and, and we've been talking about existentialism um, for the most part here. Yes. It, it, we chose determinism to uh, to sort of compound it, but. Uh, I like the idea that, and this is not me, I, I think it's Nietzsche or Sartre or someone, uh, human beings can never hope to understand why they are here. Rather, each individual must develop an independent goal and strive for it with a passionate conviction, aware of the inevitability of one's life, I'm sorry, the meaninglessness of one's life and the inevitability of one's death. Sure. Now that sounds that sounds really wordy and really deep, but essentially uh -huh. it means like if you're unhappy, 
that's you can choose to be unhappy and no one's gonna bug you about it but if you would rather choose a purpose and strive for it with a passionate conviction so I mean, not like jake i i just i just i i, I just have to um interject there because a, a lot of what you're saying about the uh, meanings of motivation essentially mm, yeah. uh, fall short on people who live in the third world we as we explained are yeah, very privileged white males who grew up in suburbia okay. and and for most I want to say 99% of the world it's not about agency it's not about motivation they are born to a class and to a system that leaves them uneducated and in poverty where their choices are not just limited but their understanding of them is also lacking oh yeah okay yeah, so for for uh... the select few we it, it is a motivational problem but for the rest of the world it is more of a uh, failing of um, capitalism and poverty right. and, and all the other global issues corruption. that it's that all about corruption. right. Yeah. And, uh, well, I just I just didn't I just had to interject there because it was like it, it just seemed a little uh, and, insensitive uh, to those who don't have the ability or you know even when they cho- right. try to choose to you know how do you go from uh, an, a, a, an, an illiterate you know uh, an illiterate uh, man in India can't just go, oh, I want to make it and fucking become a billionaire. Like, it's just, sit, right. like, you're just, some people are bound by their class and their poverty yeah, and their, right. and their, and their society and, uh, that they're in. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, how I would respond to that is a lot of those people <laughs> rely heavily on religion to get through daily, day by it's, day. It's true. And they have to. Yeah. And, and I mean, I what choice do they have? have? Yeah. Right, I would too. How else do you cope with uh, suffering? Right, and that's why I love I love Buddhism so very much. Uh, you know, existence is pain, Jerry. Uh, <laughs> Samsara. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, damn. Sorry, I was losing no, track of thought. Well, you, go, you were just talking about uh, um, Buddhism and that uh, their their belief that uh, life is suffering. How, yeah, how little control. Okay, it's a control thing. Uh, uh, well, all of it is. And what's what's great about this conversation is that my end game goal is to become a professor of philosophy with young people when I'm, you know, 55, 60, when I'm in my, you know, my, uh, my, my later <laughs> years is to right. sit and talk with young people about what they think existence is all about uh, and, and, and educate them otherwise on uh, some famous, some famous and some not so well-known uh, philosophers, people who have put together these ideas that, you know, and this is that, okay, so there we go. <laughs> That right there cannot be taken from anyone, even if they're impoverished. Sure. The, way the, that the you pursuit to of knowledge. Perceive life, and yeah. And again, it is a choice. My girlfriend at the time was right. The way that you choose to perceive life is going to shape the way that you live it. And it yeah. doesn't matter if you're a billionaire living in the Upper East Side of Manhattan, or you are shitting into a, a, a still river in. Uh, you know, going back to India, okay? If you choose to uh, identify as opposed to compare, if you choose to, you know, look at what you do have as opposed to what you don't, if you choose to, you know... Well, so I, I happen to have a, a unique uh, approach or view on, on that topic because there's cer- certain times in my life where certain calamities befall me where there's certain tragedies or, or failures or, you know, whatever you want to call it that befall me. And it would seem like the natural reaction would be to be mad or frustrated, but I almost right. take it as a cosmic joke where I'm like, oh, good one. <laughs> it, is. it is. My brother and I, <laughs> when Donald Trump was elected, uh, before he did a few good things, <laughs> which he did, he did some good things. He really did. Uh, 
we uh and we just lost we, we just to, lost half we, our viewers <laughs> i'm just kidding Go ahead. I just, and we just lost half our viewers <laughs> uh, <right, yeah. laughs> my brother and i happened to catch the same train that day okay uh, the day after the election when we knew that trump had won before okay. his inauguration it was november 9th i guess right 2016 my brother and i just happened to catch the same train an unlikelihood to say the least okay not just the same train but the same car i get on the right train <laughs> and there and my he is brother's there yeah and it's the day after that election you know right. and of course it's my brother you know of all people um <laughs> so for a second we looked at each other and we said man can you can you believe he did it you know right and it was like a shock and like uh not not uh not approval not disapproval just kind of you know uh, it, he, he's okay not a well what what's we, we, what's the point of what, what the of this uh, just, you know right and, but then we just started laughing without saying anything we right. looked at each other and it was just the novelty of it it was just at the novelty that it happened okay? right yes and and Vonnegut says, I think it's Kurt Vonnegut, uh, was that laughing or crying is what a man does when there's nothing else he can do. <laughs> okay, yeah, I right? can see that, yeah. So, it's either, you know, sit on the train and cry, or sit on the train and just fucking laugh, man, like... Sure. What the fuck? You know, even if the even if let's say the the asteroid were coming down, right, and we knew mm -hmm. it was gonna happen in the next five hours, some people would be, you know, you know, absolutely terrified and start crying and you know, and well, well, actually, out Jake, that, that's and... that's a really good point because I actually had a sh a story that I shared with my girlfriend and with. Jason uh, over the last few well, my girlfriend just a few days ago and Jason months ago where I, I, I told Jason I have a deep rooted gut feeling that in the event that I win any of the lawsuits I'm in or get any real amount of success where it would result in me having the financial security to actually not have to work and, re and be able to relax and take that deep breath of um yeah. You know, relief knowing that I, I, I have bought myself some time yeah. from the rat race of survival. Right. I, I explained that the moment that that happens, I would not be surprised in the least if the world ended through World War Three, an <laughs> asteroid, me getting hit yeah. by a bus. It, it's just one of those feelings where I'm like, it, it feels like the purpose of this is the struggle not yeah. the present or like the the end result of, of the well, gratification yeah, of it you know it's all about the journey it's not about the destination no I, I know i just i well i guess what i'm trying to say is i told that to jason and he was like mm -hmm. yeah i can see that <laughs> and yeah. i told that to my girlfriend natasha and she goes then why are you doing it like why don't you just oh. give up and i'm like it, it, it actually was so upsetting to me that I didn't talk to her for the rest of the day because I'm like, I can't have that conversation. You clearly don't know who I am or what yeah. my values are if you have that take on it. Yeah, I get that. And yeah, I understand you. But I understand you better than most. So that's, that's true. Unfair. Well, do you uh, have any closing remarks? I, I want to kind of end the uh, end this whole session here because we're at the two hours and... Some some change mark here. I can't believe we've been talking this long. Um, so I think this uh, conversation went well. Uh, oh, we'll talk about that after. Yeah, that. we could have another uh, session. So you know. I uh, let me think. I <laughs> I used to say that too, though. Uh, that I'll probably die the day after I get my shit together. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and it's uh, it's somewhat. Uh, you know, you, you sort of feel that in the back of your head that you know this, this, is, this yeah. is what it's all about. It's all about the the process of going through uh, adversity, tribulation, <laughs> trials yeah. to learn. You know, it's funny. My the job that I'm currently in a lawsuit over um, actually had a big banner uh, that I looked at every day, and it just said "Trust the process." Ooh, that's good. Is it in Philly? <laughs> No? Yeah, yeah, it was that the uh, the one in, in Philadelphia or Pennsylvania, I should say. Do you know why it said that? That was just like they're the company, like fucking 
it, like, it's, a sl- it's a slogan that the Philadelphia 76ers had for two or three years when they were oh, putting really? together a team with uh, Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid and JJ Redick and they were there was a, while they were rebuilding the team they knew that the seasons that they were going to play weren't going to be all that great okay so they were just telling the fans <laughs> to trust the process <laughs> okay oh my god don't expect too much it, you know it, it, it's funny that such uh, trivial statements by sports or other figures Seem to resonate profe- like relevant. as profound thing, and I and I want to close it with the statement from one of the cafeteria workers at Cherry Hill West, where when dispersing French fries, you would get a cup, and if you asked for more French fries, she would respond, "You get what the cup holds." <laughs> and I've and I know that she is basically a retarded person serving French fries. But that statement is so profound, I cannot express how much it has uh, affected me. I see, I see, I see. You get what the cup holds. Yeah, so do you want to end it there? Any last uh, statements? No, I think you get what the cup holds is a pretty good place to end, don't you? (laughs) I do. So on that, uh, good luck. I I love you, man. And uh, I I hope we get to, you know, uh, catch up soon. Yeah, I'll talk to you. Yeah. All right, cool. I'll catch you later, man. Did you end the recording?